In World War II, the U.S. Navy made effective use of two powerful weapons which had not theretofore been employed to any extent. One was the carrier, a mobile airstrip from which planes were launched within easy range of enemy targets in the far corners of the Pacific. The other was the submarine. The war with Japan across the broad stretches of the Pacific constituted the greatest naval struggle in history. That war was fought not only on the surface of the sea, but above and beneath it as well. Advanced techniques for waging war called for improved facilities for treating the men injured in this new kind of warfare. The employment of the machines of modern war necessitated not only a drastic change in the strategy of warfare, but required streamlined methods for saving the lives of the fighting men who fell victim to this high-speed 20th century type of battle. In a large percentage of cases, the saving of these lives depended directly on quick treatment of the wounds. In the U.S. Navy, ships waging war against the enemy anywhere in the Pacific had to be prepared to deal efficiently with the most difficult cases. The maintenance of these shipboard hospitals in constant readiness for any emergency was one small function of the Navy's complex supply system. During World War II in the Pacific, the U.S. Navy was confronted with a supply problem unprecedented in history. To provide desperately needed materiel to its ships at sea and to bases all over the broad Pacific, the Navy went into the exporting business on a large scale. At U.S. ports, the equipment and supplies bound for American fighting men in the Pacific Asiatic Theater were prepared for shipment. It was no wonder there was a shortage of code names with so many islands in the Pacific to label. A most vital consideration in fighting a war across the Pacific was, of course, the maintenance of U.S. fleets in top condition, equipped with every facility necessary to the conduct of a successful amphibious drive westward to Japan. In World War II, the U.S. Navy grew to proportions never dreamed of by even the most optimistic old line admiral. But the Navy was concerned not only with war at sea, its supply service stored and transported the machines of war needed in the countless land campaigns against the enemy in the Pacific. Another high priority cargo on Navy transports was the American fighting man, who was in the last analysis the most important factor in the outcome of the war. The job of keeping all the Navy's warships all across the Pacific in fighting shape was in itself a demanding operation. The ability of a naval task force to wage war for an extended period was directly related to the speed and efficiency of the Navy's supply service. The great cruising range of the U.S. fleets in the Pacific was made possible only by means of regular rendezvous between the warships and supply vessels, which delivered everything from aspirin to ammunition. In enemy waters particularly, nothing which might act as a marker for an enemy ship or plane could be simply thrown overboard. Of all the items transported to the fighting men from the U.S., mail ranked close to the top of the list of most important cargo. The arrival of a fresh batch of mail always had a tonic effect on the men. The armed services soon came to realize there was nothing that could lift a man's morale so quickly as a letter from home. Tony, Germania, Harris, Hope, Jay. But even the Navy's fleet post office couldn't come through 100% every time. Sometimes, luckily not very often, a valuable shipment of supplies would fail to reach its destination due either to accident or enemy action.
Keeping the ships of the line in good repair was also in large measure the job of the Navy Supply Service. At strategic points across the Pacific, naval facilities were prepared to put crippled ships into top fighting condition in short order. To achieve those miracles of repair, some of the Navy's far-flung bases were as well equipped as Navy yards in the U.S. One of the most demanding assignments on the Navy supply system's crowded schedule was the transporting of the material needed for the launching of large-scale invasions against the enemy. But the movement of vehicles, weapons, and supplies to bases in the far Pacific was only part of the job. Each invasion, large and small, would involve still another trip across water to the ultimate objective. 20th century naval warfare bore little resemblance to the classic sea battles of earlier generations. During World War II, the submarine was used to good advantage by the U.S. Navy, and especially so in the Pacific. The departure of a sub on a dangerous mission was always a dramatic moment for everyone involved. It might be several months before she'd make home port again, if she was lucky. Throughout the war in the Pacific, the submarines of the U.S. Navy were manned by volunteers only. The inside of a sub was no place for a man with claustrophobia. Each sub was a living, breathing being to the men and the crew, who were fiercely proud of their vessel. A lot of people used to ask me why I volunteered for the submarine service. They couldn't understand anyone wanting to spend months at a time cooped up, with little chance for escape if anything happened. But it wasn't so bad, especially during the early days just out of port. For my money, Life on a sub at crouching in a muddy foxhole beat six ways to Sunday. taking a look around every now and then. You never knew when you might come across something interesting. Overtaking a Japanese junk meant a break in the routine of the patrol. It was easy to imagine the excitement the pirates must have had in the old days. And after being down below for quite a while, we felt as though we were really in the war when we hauled in Honest to Pete live Japs. We never managed to take many prisoners, and it's just as well, considering our limited quarters. Our prize was quickly disposed of. Any prisoners we took were always given a good going over. Every once in a while, we actually got some tips on what the enemy was up to. It wasn't hard to tell when we moved into enemy waters. There was a change in the atmosphere. The lookouts kept a sharper watch. Sighting our first enemy ship, was one of the most exciting moments of the patrol. The lives of the crew depended on how fast the sub got underwater. Moving in on the enemy was a slow, careful business, but we all had the routine down cold. The ideal position was about a thousand yards from the target, if it was possible to get that close without being detected. It was important that we be patient. Our position had to be just right for us to score the best possible hit. Down periscope. Angle on the bow, starboard 15. Right full rudder. Right full rudder. All ahead two thirds. All ahead two thirds. 
New course 240. New course 240. What's the distance to the track? 1700. Control, 63 feet. Fire one. Walking up another chunk of enemy tonnage gave us a thrill every time. But sometimes that feeling didn't last long. If an enemy destroyer was in the neighborhood, there was a good chance we'd be detected. Take her down. We could expect a depth charge any second. We could be sure there'd be more ash cans dropped on us if we didn't shake him right away. Needless to say, we didn't waste any time doing just that. On most patrols, we stayed in enemy waters for several weeks before heading back to our base. Sometimes weeks went by without meeting a thing, but every minute we were out, we had to be ready to act quick the second we spotted the enemy. Our American sub crews Several months in enemy waters was the longest stretch without a break. Like the Navy's planes and ships, the boats proudly displayed their record against the enemy. During World War II in the Pacific, submarines were sometimes used to transport Army or Marine raiders on quick strikes against enemy-held islands. Whatever the assignment, the submariners could be counted on to do the job well. On Oahu at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel, the men of the submarine service had every opportunity to take their minds off the war. The Navy had taken over the hotel and submariners had number one priority. The men of the silent service could have almost anything their heart desired. Usually, a submariner's leave at the Royal Hawaiian was for two carefree weeks. At Waikiki Beach, the war seemed a million miles away. On their leave, the submariners had a chance to navigate above the surface of the water for a change. Free of their cramped quarters for a few weeks, some of the men welcomed the chance to get the kinks out of their legs. The U.S. Navy's victories during World War II in the Pacific were due in large measure to the outstanding performance of her carriers. And that performance was possible only through a high degree of teamwork on the part of each of the men and the crews of those fighting ships. The job of loading the planes with the missiles which would soon be deposited on the enemy was quickly accomplished. The men who armed the planes felt just as much a part of the strike against the enemy as the pilots themselves. Of the carrier's complement, the pilots were in one sense the most important members of the team. Before a mission, everything possible was done to help them to relax. <laughs> In the ready room, the airmen were briefed for the last time. Any new bits of intelligence about enemy activities on the target island were included. Quarter station. As the time for the strike drew near, the crew went into action. Some stood by, prepared to cope with a sudden fire. Others readied the planes for the launching. Focus, tell the pilots to man the plane. Aye, aye, sir. Ready room from flight control. Pilots, man your plane. 
While the flat top turned into the wind, the pilots prepared for the takeoff. For some of the new pilots, this was it. With everyone on the mark, the strike was officially begun. Stand by to start engine. Stand clear of propellers. Start engine. Each man on the ship had a specific assignment. No matter how small, each job had to be performed without a hitch, or the entire operation would be upset. Finally, with its wings unfolded and locked into place, the lead plane was all set to go. when there wasn't much wind, the planes could not be launched in the usual way. But there was no need to postpone the strike. In that kind of weather, a catapult was used to push the planes into the air. Throughout World War II, U.S. carrier-based planes kept up a steady attack against the enemy in the Pacific. Carrier pilots flew tens of thousands of sorties against enemy shipping, aircraft, and land bases. In a great percentage of cases, the enemy targets could be reached only by carrier-based planes. Returning from a strike, the airmen flew the most direct course back to that welcome speck on the sea. Taking the planes back aboard was an even more exacting operation than the launching. Once a pilot was given a come ahead, he didn't waste any time getting himself and his plane back onto the flight deck. The landing signal officer guided him in. Once again, every part of the operation had to be accomplished with great speed. While the flat top was taking her planes aboard, she was vulnerable to enemy attack since she could not maneuver. The planes had to be landed in the shortest possible space of time. Once a plane was safely aboard, the deck was prepared for the next arrival in a matter of seconds. The returning aircraft were quickly moved to their assigned positions on the flight deck. On a carrier in action, deck space was at a premium. Every available square foot was utilized. Sometimes the landing signal officer had a real cause for worry. Firefighters and other crewmen moved fast. An accident really upset the landing pattern, especially when there was more than one plane in distress. Sometimes a pilot in trouble wouldn't even try to make the ship. Rockets had to be jettisoned. Then the airmen made ready to leave the plane as soon as it hit. 
This would have to be the most skillful landing of his career. The downed pilot was in luck. Once out of the plane, the pilot had a rubber life raft handy to make his stay in the water a good deal safer and more comfortable. During World War II in the Pacific Theater, hundreds of carrier pilots were able to cheat death, thanks to the equipment which the Navy had provided for such situations. If necessary, the pilot could exist for an extended period on the raft, inasmuch as he was well supplied with food and water, as well as preparations for combating the elements. But for a pilot who had been spotted by a fellow American airman, the stay in the raft would not be a long one. The Air Sea Rescue Service could be counted on to function quickly. In a very short time, a Navy patrol plane would arrive, and the downed pilot's troubles were just about over. In some cases, depending of course on the location, a pilot who was forced to ditch his plane was picked up within an hour, and none the worse for the experience. In no time at all, he would be back at a base, ready to become part of another flat tops complement of flyers. In late 1943 and early 44, the Japanese wall of defense in the Pacific was punctured by fast U.S. carrier fleets. To the north, Marcus Island was hit hard. A heavy raid was made on the Marianas. Another carrier task force hit truck with devastating results. Toward the end of 1944, Formosa became a prime target for U.S. Navy carrier forces. For several months in late 1944 and early 1945, Navy carriers spanned the Pacific, almost to the Asian mainland, to get in position for the attacks. Marine pilots supplemented regular Navy carrier airmen in the strikes against the enemy's important island stronghold off the China coast. 120 miles from the target, the planes were ready for the attack. The crewmen functioned almost automatically, so familiar was the pattern of the takeoff operation. The carrier strikes on important enemy islands helped materially to shorten the span of time involved in bringing the war to the enemy's doorstep. The Japanese on Formosa fought back stubbornly. But the carrier planes continued to press the attack. It is impossible to assess exactly the amount of damage done to the enemy by carrier-based aircraft during World War II. But it has been proved beyond any doubt that the flat top was one of the Navy's most potent weapons in the Pacific. Early in 1944, the Marshall Islands were the principal objective for U.S. amphibious forces in the Central Pacific. On January 31st, they invaded Kwajalein. Dominating the waters of two oceans, this mighty fleet grows at the rate of at least one new warship every day. Its battleships can throw shells the weight of freight cars for 25 miles and hit. Long, lean destroyers can speed into action at more than 40 knots. The world's fastest and most deadly, they are dangerous to battleships 20 times larger. Almost as fast as destroyers, but far tougher, are the hard-hitting cruisers, the most formidable scouting and raiding force in the world. Heavy weather is nothing to these stout-hearted ships and men. 
They smashed into seas like this to escort the carrier Hornet to within 400 miles of Japan. The mighty battle wagon and the eyes of the ship hurled into the air for reconnaissance and spotting the target. General Porter. 2,000 men go into action, coordinated like a precision-built machine. Bulkhead doors close. The guns are ready. On the double to battle station. And then, shattering salvo. Clouds of searing flame shoot forth when 16-inch guns roar into action. More than two tons of powder explode with every broadside. Here is the brute force of the fleet. Second only to sinking in that Jap ship, the thrill for a Navy man is a letter from home. And remember, no matter where he is, he'll get it. The romantic bygone days of wooden ships and iron men return with the PT boats. Smallest and fastest in the fleet, they hold the honor of hitting the first American naval flow against Jap ships, sinking at least one big cruiser off the Philippines. At 60 miles an hour, they are hard to hit, but they can hit hard. Lighter than aircraft have played their part in the Navy's coordinated offensive against enemy submarines on the Atlantic coast. The wolf packs have been decimated and steadily driven from the sea lanes. A convoy assembled and coastal waters for miles around are watched from hovering blimps, ever ready to drop depth charges and press an attack until surface units can rush in for a kill. Navy's most dangerous surface. United States submarines are manned by volunteers selected for their courage and great skill. They have steadily destroyed Jap transports and fighting ships right in the enemy's home waters. The largest carry as many as 20 torpedoes. And they fight on the surface, too. Here is an actual encounter with an armed Jap patrol vessel filmed in Asiatic waters. No fighting ships of the fleet more often receive the traditional message, well done. But of all the combat units in coordinated sea power, the naval air arm continues to roll up the most staggering score against the Japs. In spite of battle losses, the United States Navy possesses by far the world's largest, fastest fleet of aircraft carriers. Now, the camera records a flaming battle action near the Marshall Islands. Navy cameramen film some of the most thrilling combat scenes ever shown. The planes take off on a daring battle mission to blast Jap bases, sink two light cruisers, and four other ships. More than 85 enemy planes are swept from the sky. One of the carriers is attacked by Jap torpedo planes. The desperate enemy maneuvers for position. They drop deadly torpedoes as the carrier twists and turns, her barrage of tracer bullets flashing like flaming spears. With uncanny accuracy, our gunners begin to pile up a flaming score. This wounded Jap screams in close to a ship and is doomed. His wreckage flames on the sea. Here's where training counts. Another bullseye is scored. Again, the desperate enemy flyers try to cripple the carrier, but her heroic gunners destroy plane after plane.
Still another burning, crippled warbird crashes into the sea. But the mighty climax of this epic battle is still to come. Now we see the carrier's closest call in the entire action. Almost over the deck, a direct hit rips off a wing. The Jap is doomed and crashes in a shattering eruption only a few feet away. And again, a vicious enemy has met his master.